And here is, uh, so th this little bit of code, don't worry too much about how, what the code exactly, um, you know, how it, how, it, how it works, but it, it, it pulls the MNIST data set from the Flux package. The Flux is Julia's machine learning library, but we'll also use later in the practical today, other libraries to pull the um, MNIST data set and plots uh, the first 30 images. Okay, so these are handwritten images. They were already cleaned, curated, and processed so that they all pretty much fit within the figure. They've been normalized. So often what we, you would do with, with data that's raw, you would spend a lot of time normalizing it uh, prior, et cetera. Okay, um, and, and this code here, how the code works is not, is not the key issue, but the point is that when you, when you get a data set or any data set, the first thing that you might do in, in any case is do some EDA, some exploratory data analysis. And in this case, exploratory data analysis looks at, for example, uh, what is the proportion of pixels that are completely pitch dark in the data set? So that's about 80%. And what proportion is, uh, as bright as possible. So that's less than 1%, okay? And this is also a plot of the distribution of the number of the non-off pixels per digit. So each point in the data set, each one of the images has a label, a label being zero to nine. And you can then see that you see uh, there's one digit here, which I believe is a digit one, with, where the distribution of the number of non-zero pixels is significantly, uh, has a center of mass, it's significantly less than the other digits. So that's some general type of data analysis that you might do with data sets. Here we're looking at the label counts. So we're asking how many zeros are there out of the training data set? How many ones, how many twos, up to how many nines? And when you see a data set that's like this, you pretty much say that it is balanced. It's not exactly that balanced, but it's certainly not a biased data set. Okay, so there's pretty much one tenth of the uh, images are for each digit. One tenth of that is, is 6,000. Now, when you have such a data set, you can do all kinds of things. One thing that, that we've done here, which is certainly not the focus of the course, is something called principal component analysis. Okay, so just in a word, and you have a, a much more of a description here. Many of you would know what PCA is anyway. Uh, principal component analysis um, takes the data point, which we view as a vector in 784 dimensional space. Okay, a data point is a vector in 784 dimensional space. And finds a way to project it onto a lower dimensional space. In this case, we were seeking two principal components, so it projects it onto a two dimensional space. Okay, so, uh, and the way it does it, it, it looks for the, uh, com well, the different way, it's basically singular value decomposition, or alternatively, we can look at the covariance matrix of the data and look at the eigenvalues of the data, and then we take the, uh, the eigenvectors with the highest associated eigenvalues. Okay, and these would be pointing in the direction of principal components. So that's, that's principal components in the very rough way in a nutshell. Now, what, what PCA is, it's a form of data reduction, okay? So in this plot, uh, what you see is we only did uh, PCA for zero digits and for one digits, okay? So again, a, a one image is a point in 784 dimensional space. A zero image is a point in 784 dimensional space. But when we use the projection that's prescribed by PCA, we actually see quite a nice separation between zero and one, okay? Uh, as opposed to that, if we, uh, we're not looking at all, all pairs here. This is just zero, one, and two, and three, and four, and five, et cetera, in, the, in this specific plot, okay? But if we were comparing two and three, then two principal components don't create a very nice separation between the two, okay? Um, in any case, this type of, of, uh, of PCA hints that when you're trying to, when you'll try to do classification later on, sometimes you might want to do data reduction prior and maybe not reduce it from 784 dimensions into two dimensions, but maybe from 784 to 10 or to 15. And there's more to say on that. But this is just a taste of PCA, which is one of the main methods of unsupervised learning, uh, which isn't our focus. Okay. See, I can't see the chat window this way. Okay, no questions so far. All right. <coughs>
another type of unsupervised learning process that we can carry on this data set is clustering. Now, clustering, there are all kinds of advanced clustering methods and also simple methods that we don't do here, such as hierarchical clustering and others. But here we can look at k-means clustering. Um, now, when you're, when you're clustering, what you're doing is you're considering each of the points of the data set is again living in 784 dimensional space, something that we can't ima imagine, but you've got these points in Euclidean space. Okay. And we would like to find clusters of points that are similar in the sense that they are close to each other based on the typical Euclidean distance. Okay. So if two, if two images are exactly the same, they're exactly together, but if they only differ by a few pixel intensities, then maybe they're not so far in that high dimensional space. Now, as we do that, one thing that if we, we can prescribe, find two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, five clusters, how many clusters are sensible for the MNIST data set? I mean, we, we kind of know how many types of images there are. So I'm looking at the chat now, well, 10. Right, that's kind of the sensible thing to expect. If we do that and we specify uh, to a, this is a black box k-means algorithm and say, hey, k-means, please take the data set X and cluster it into 10 clusters. Um, then what we get is a collection of per image, which cluster it belongs to. But as a byproduct, there are also these centers also known as the centroids of the clusters. Now, these centers are kind of averages, Euclidean averages of all of the points that have been said to belong to a single cluster, okay? And if we just plot these centers, then you get these images here. These are certainly not the images of the digits zero through nine in an ordered manner. And it even seems like the digit nine is maybe repeated because the clustering wasn't perfect. But what you see is you get kind of average images, which are average of all, averages of all of the others. Okay, that's just to see that you can do a bit of clustering. You can experiment more with that. And I haven't specified exactly how the k-means clustering algorithm works. It's specified here, but I'll skip that because it's tangential to our stuff. And we spend a good time of the lecture working on the Apple Pencil, uh, unsuccessfully, by the way. Okay, still any questions? Okay, so now we're kind of the, at the heart of what this course is going to be about classification and regression problems. So these are the two types of problems that exist as part of supervised learning. So in a classification problem, what you're doing is you're developing some function f hat, which takes your input image or your input feature set or your input vector and gives you a label, one through capital K. In our case, capital K is 10. Okay, and the labels would be one through 10. Of course, you know, you can renumber the digits zero to nine and move them to be one to 10. Okay, there, there's a finite set of labels and a small finite set. In a regression problem, you're trying to find a function that gets your input features or your input vector, your input image and gives you a real valued number. That's kind of the two, the two basic things. Okay, so the process of, in machine learning, there, there are two things you do with this function. So there are pretty much two, two types of things. One is you learn, you find out, you develop this function. That's the process of learning in general. That's is you look at the data and you learn. Another one is you just use it, okay? When we use many of our apps that do image recognition of sorts, voice recognition of sorts, they use some sort of quote unquote AI, they've already have that function in there coded. Okay, it already knows how to uh, look at a picture and know if it's your face or somebody else's face, for example. Uh, when you're doing the development cycle, then you're training, then you're actually creating this function. You do that based on data, okay? So in the case of MNIST, of course, yeah, K would be 10. And here's this discussion about the fact that, you know, it's not one to 10, it's zero to nine, but that's just a matter of convention. Now. Often in classification, we reduce the problem to binary classification. We don't have to do that, but that's often the case, okay? With some forms of classifiers that are not deep learning classifiers, that's, that's almost necessary, okay? So binary classification is a problem where you don't have 10 labels where K is not 10, but K is only two, okay? K equals one is not interesting, but K is two is very interesting. 
is it a cat or is it a dog? Is it a one digit or is it not a one digit? Okay. So say that now we had uh, 10 binary classifiers, each one that we'd call f hat subscript i, okay? And that's a classifier that determines if something is a digit i or not a digit i, okay? Then one way to create a general classifier from that is to use this mechanism, which we see here. But for this mechanism, we also need, in addition to the classifier, which tells us what the digit is, we also need a, an, a, a second function, f hat subscript i superscript c, which is kind of the quality of how good we think or our belief in, in do we think this is an i or not, okay? And that's gonna happen throughout this course when we do deep learning. So in one sense, we're gonna in a sense and then just classify, is it a cat or is it a dog? But before that, we might wanna say, do we believe it's a cat with probability 70% and then the complement 30% is a dog, okay? Or something like that. So FIC is a measure of, of our belief of how strongly we believe this thing is a digit I, okay? And it often comes as a byproduct of the classifier. It just, it, you, you, you'll see it. You'll see it when we get there. So, when you have this thing, well, what you can do is you can take, you can create a binary, you can create this classifier, which we'll call a multi-class classifier because it tells you is something a one, a two, a three, a four, up to a K versus a, it's not just a binary classifier, it's a multi-class classifier by just choosing the I which maximizes this belief measure, this measure of certainty, okay? Now this strategy is called the one versus rest or the one versus all strategy. So you actually use a binary classifier and you use a collection of K binary classifiers to create a multi-class classifier. And you'll probably even see it in the next couple of lectures uh, with Benoit speaking about logistic regression. Um, okay, because logistic regression in its own right is a binary classifier. You'll, you'll also speak with you about uh, logistic softmax regression, which is a multi-class classifier built in. Now, at the start of the lecture, I was asked about this. There is another strategy, which we won't really use in the course. So this is not the most important paragraph. There's another strategy, which we call the one versus rest, or the, uh, sorry, there's a, uh, not the one versus, the one versus one strategy. There's another strategy, which is one versus one. So the one versus one strategy looks at the 10 digits, and considers all of the possible competitions that can happen. A digit two versus a digit three, a digit seven versus a digit eight, a digit seven versus a digit two, etc. Okay, and there are 10 over two, uh, K over two such competitions. So this, this is a number that grows quadratically with the number of labels, okay? And then that classifier would work by creating the multi-class classifier as follows, it would sum up for all of the J's that are not I, uh, the certainty, and it would choose uh, the most certain I. But we won't really use this strategy. It's simply here for completeness because we've spoken about one versus rest. So it's also good that you see the other way you can do it, which is one versus one. Okay, any questions about this? I'm in the meanwhile, happily here writing with my pen. No, I'm not, I'm trying to write with a pen, but it's not. Okay, so that's classification. Now in regression, um, what you do is you try to actually uh, get a real valued number, okay? So imagine, that's not the case, but imagine that with the MNIST data set that we could have, in addition to each digit, we had a label or a response variable or a Y, I'm just using synonyms for the same thing. Label, by the way, you typically think of it as something from a discrete set, but you could also think of, in general of labels, just a response variable, okay? And that label would be how many milliseconds it took to write the digit, okay? I mean, clearly, I mean, writing ones is probably quicker than writing eights, okay? So a regression problem would be given the image, predict how long it took to, to write it. Okay, so applications of classification. So now we get back to this type of thing that I've shown you before. And I, I just, I just wanna, the, 
run it live again. And, and so, so you understand this code that we're running here, which in this case took a bit less than half a second. And this is just on a computer without a GPU, et cetera, with a proper GPU and hardware, this could do it, this could do it in, you know, in, a, in a few microseconds, okay? This type of thing didn't exist um, in 2010. It actually, this network was developed in 2014 and it's based uh, on the original AlexNet from 2012. But you know, in 2010, nobody could imagine that you'd have a general purpose piece of software for which you can load any image from the web that you'd like and ask it, hey, please classify this image for me. And it will tell you what it sees. I mean, I personally see here a baby, a uh, diaper nappy napkin is something secondary, but uh, still it kind of works. Um, so the level of accuracy achieved on the image net classification via these types of networks is, is, is accuracy of around 90%. Uh, and that's, that's kind of at the heart of the deep learning revolution. And that's probably why we're here in this course. Okay, so you're seeing this run here. Again, this is a pre-trained network. And what it's doing inside is it's running through all of these layers of a convolutional deep neural network. There are 19 layers. That's what's called VGG19. And these layers are basically doing linear operations on the input image. Again, the input image is a tensor and then passing it through a nonlinearity. Linear operations, nonlinearity. Linear operations, nonlinearity, doing all of that. The pre-trained network just remembers the parameters of the linear operation. So it remembers all of these matrices, half a gigabyte of them. Okay, and then it's able to pretty much see any sensible image and give you one of a thousand labels. There are a thousand labels in the, so this is classification where capital K is a thousand. There's a thousand labels in the ImageNet data set. Okay. All right. Um, here's uh, just, just because I, I burned time on the, um, on the pen saga. Uh, then I'll, I'll skip this, but th this is just applications of regression. This is a bit of R code where what you're supposed to see here is, well, this is re regression in the classic sense that you uh, learned, you know, uh, house price versus square footage. Uh, but then you can also create an additional feature. Okay. So sometimes you create the feature yourself and uh, people in machine learning call this feature engineering. So you might say, hey, let's add another feature and that feature would be house price squared. I mean, you've seen this fitting a parabola before. Okay, but you can also do it in very high dimensional cases. Okay, now if we're willing to assume a, a statistical model, then of course statistics gives us much more than just a prediction. We actually get uh, prediction bands and confidence bands and all that, uh, but we won't deal with that much in the course. And um, the key point here that's not actually written in the course, but, but you could see is that when you go from a linear model to a quadratic model, then your loss, I still didn't define fully what the loss is, but that's okay. You know from linear regression that loss is the sum of squares, okay? Then the loss actually reduces, but then when you try it on data for which you have not um, trained your classifier on, you see that the loss, that there is an increase of the loss, okay? So this 5.48, 5.63, uh, it seems like you, the, the test accuracy, the test loss is potentially bigger than the train loss. And that's, that can be a cause for concern. Uh, but we'll speak about it more and you'll actually see it in the further units uh, more. Okay, now a second example that I'll also skip just due, uh, due to time is this uh, project called Safe Blues that Sharat and uh, myself and several other colleagues are involved with. Uh, but the point is that you, you could, you might have seen this uh, two and a half minute video that describes what, what Safe Blues does. Uh, so this is a case of scientific machine learning where we actually used a quite simple neural network to predict the situation of the epidemic here in days 100 to 115 based on these measured virtual epidemics um, and only based on the training data, which is here, okay? So up to day zero to 100, you have training data and then you can continue and get some signal of these predicted epidemics and, and predict where the epidemic's going. Okay, that's kind of the key story, but that's, so that's an application of, of neural networks in epidemiology. Uh, and yeah, I, I just suggest watching this video. Okay, I'll, I'll soon slow down because I wanna slow down on the things that are slightly more technical. All right, 
So when we're doing learning, there's kind of a workflow. And you could probably call that workflow the training, development, and testing workflow. So you go in a cycle of training, development, testing, training, development, testing, et cetera, training, development, testing. Okay. Now, in general, we need to differentiate between the seen data, which is the data set we have, and the unseen data, which is everything else. And our assumption and hope is that our data comes from some distribution, joint distribution of, of X and Y, okay, which we don't specify formally in this course. Okay? And anything else that we see will also follow the same distributional law. I mean, that's kind of the general rule of statistics and science at Chedzi, all right? Uh, but just, uh, just to claim that you actually have to work to make this happen, right? So you, may, you must make sure that when you collect data that your seen data, you know, is not biased from something that's, you know, very specific, that it's representative as much as you can of the whole population, etc. But keep in mind that we're training, we're doing the training, developing and testing on the seen data. And then we develop a product, a product. that product is F hat, and we give F hat to the unseen data, okay? There is, there's a different paradigm, a more modern paradigm, which kind of continues to learn and, and the, where the unseen data that then becomes seen is seen and continues the learning process, and that's called active learning, okay? but we won't deal with that too much in this course. And uh, maybe Benoit will be able to briefly mention it in uh, chapter six. Okay. Now, when you're looking at the same data, then you're looking at training, validation, and testing. So what is training, validation, and testing? By training, you are training your model on some subset of the data. And then you might be thinking, is this model good or not? And does it have the good parameters, yes or not, that you can choose? And these parameters are hyperparameters, okay? Training is a process of learning parameters, but there are also tuning parameters, which we call hyperparameters, okay? Hyperparameters might involve part of the algorithm that you used, okay? But they might also involve, um, you know, like learning rate and things like that, and you'll see what it means. But hyperparameters can also, uh, in a sense, engulf the type of architecture that you have or the type of model which you have, okay? So you're jumping between training and validation and training and validation. And in this cycle of training and validation, you're tuning and tuning and tuning your hyperparameters. As you do that, you still don't get to testing because testing is often with a test set that you should ideally keep aside and only test on once, okay? And that set should be home similar. Everything should be shuffled from the seen data, okay? And that test set, you're going to uh, then see how well your uh, classifier or predictor in the case of regression performs. That's what it is. All right. So let's see this on a, on a very simple example. Now, hold on for one more second. Dash L. Oh, my dog here in the background nibbling at something. Uh, maybe I should give him the Apple Pencil to nibble on. Might do good. All right. So <coughs> we're going to start with a, with a, with a very naive, a very simple classifier, uh, which is in no way what you need to do, but it's, but it's at least something that, 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 that kind of shows, well, learning can happen. So let's think of an ad hoc classifier. And by ad hoc, I just mean, this is some classifier that we picked out of the hat, where what we wanna do is we only wanna say if a digit is a one digit or not, okay? So we'll take our MNIST data set, there are 60,000 training images, and we'll pick the one digits and we'll call these positive. And we'll pick the other digits and we'll call them negative, meaning they're not, okay? We're, we're searching for a one, a one is what we're searching. So anything that's not a one is like a negative one, okay? Now, if you try to kind of design such classifier from first principles to kind of think what, what you are, then what you can see is that a, a, a one digit, if you plot a one digit, it's roughly a vertical line going straight up. Let's see if we can get, again, I'm sorry, I cannot draw today, it hinders, but it's hopefully survivable. Um, so let's see if we've got a one digit in this example set here. Yeah, you see, 
look at these one digits. This is a one digit, 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 the others are of course not. And one digits are pretty much kind of a line going straight up. I mean, this one is quite different than this one, right? This one on the right has kind of a, this is one where somebody really cared. Okay, and this one is just a line, but they're both, we both kind of agree they're a one. So the way this, this uh, ad hoc classifier, certainly not a deep neural network uh, and not even a generic machine learning classifier will work is it's going to search horizontally. This is where drawing would have been good for if I could have drawn to you. Search horizontally and find the pixel of highest intensity, breaking ties uh, kind of uh, arbitrarily. <laughs> for each line. So we denote this pixel like this. So we search for every row i, we search for the j where xij is maximal, okay? The brightest pixel. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at how much uh, energy or how many pixels are lit two above and two below that pixel. So that number two is kind of a hyperparameter. It's maybe something that's kind of pre-specified, okay? It's, it's pre-specified because we know that our images are, here's an image, you know, this is an image, it's 28 by 28, so you kind of go two pixels to the left, two pixels to the right from the brightest pixel. But that's a hyperparameter for this learning algorithm, okay? So for this classification algorithm. And once we do that, and at this point only look at the left-hand plot here, okay? If you would plot this quantity, which is the, uh, the brightness of the pixels for negative examples for non one digits, well, then you see that there's quite a lot of mass here. And if you uh, plot them for one digits, you'd see that it's a, quite a lot here. Okay. So, and, and you then, you, you then, I think maybe that's not written in the notes and it should be, it should actually then be normalized by the total sum of pixels. Okay. So, so this is actually missing here. I should fix this. So we then divide this by the total intensity of pixels in that image, okay? So uh, chi should be that divided, divide what's highlighting here by the total intensity of pixels in the whole image. So one, one digits have most of their energy, most of their pixels lit up around that maximal pixel, okay? And that's why their distribution, that's their empirical distribution is here to the right. And the non one digits are there, okay? Now, when we see such a separation, then we, we can kind of create a classifier, okay? We see it won't be perfect, but we can pick a threshold here. This threshold is theta, this vertical line threshold. And what this threshold is going to do, it's gonna say, well, a classifier will say if the, what you see is to the left of the threshold, then claim it's not a one. Okay, call it a negative one. If it's to the right, call it a positive example, it's a one, okay? Now, of course, in tuning this threshold theta, we have a trade-off, right? So if we were to put it all the way to the left, then we'll say that everything is ones. And if we were to put it all the way to the right, then we'll say that everything is, is uh, negative ones, okay? But uh, that's okay, all right? So the, Question then is how to find the best threshold. But for this, let's speak about some performance measures. Okay, is the is the way that this naive classifier works uh, kind of unclear? It's a, it's a it's a very handcrafted classifier for one digits. I mean, will it work for any other digit really? I mean, this is really specific for one. Do you think it will work for any other digit if you if you try it not on one digits? <laughs> Probably no, right? So it's, I mean, this is not the type of machine learning algorithm that, that we aspire to have, but it's good enough for our introductory lecture to kind of see, hey, this is a classification problem. So let's let's now think how to quantify this classifier. And as we, uh, yeah, it's really bad for five as somebody said, yeah, maybe for seven, uh, there's a suggestion, right? So there's, um, I agree, all right, so, yeah, but, but it's, it's maybe good to see also to kind of distinguish between kind of classic programming that kind of looks at the input and machine learning algorithms, which will aim that will aim that they'll be much more generic than this thing. Okay, so 
quickly, how do we classify, how do we describe the accuracy of this thing or the performance, I should say. I should say performance, not accuracy, because accuracy is one performance measure. The most basic performance measure that you use is accuracy, and that is just the proportion of successes out of the total number of attempts. So what we would do is we would look at the validation set uh, and we'll say, um, you know, how many of the positive samples that we got are correct. Okay. However, for this specific example, accuracy is not a good performance measure. We, we generally, as humans, we like accuracy because you'll say, hey, I got a model that's trained and my accuracy is 95%, et cetera, or 90% or 99%. By the way, MNIST, you can get a classifier to like 99.7% these days, okay. something like that. But keep in mind that MNIST has been overtrained because we also see the test set. All right, so we don't like this accuracy because, and the, 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 the description is here, and you probably read this, because the, the example we had here is not balanced. MNIST in its own right is balanced, but this example has only 6,742 positive samples, and the remaining, like 53,000 in a bit, are negative samples, okay? So if you just had a sample that's like, if you just had a very naive classifier, just said that, negative one, you know, it's like, well, negative one, I don't care. I don't even want to look at X. Whatever X is, I'm just going to say it's negative one. You'll get an accuracy that's close to 90%. Okay. So we need other measures for, um, in this case. So the two common measures that we use here are called precision and recall. And there's a bit of a discussion here comparing that to sensitivity and specificity, and also to uh, one minus type one error and to beta in classical statistics. And the things are not exactly the same. So basically precision uh, is the proportion of true positives here. So, so then we, okay, so let me just explain this table very quickly. So you look at the reality, you say label is negative one. You had quite a bit with label negative one, label is positive one here. We decided negative one, we decided positive one, okay? We like true negatives, meaning we decide negative one if the label is negative one, and we like true positives, meaning we decide positive one if the label is positive one, okay? This happened to be a very random number, a thousand. That's just a matter of, of kind of luck, okay? So the precision is the uh, true positives divided by uh, true positive plus false positive by this column, and the recall is this. Okay, so these two measures kind of the capture together um, what is your, uh, how good you're doing uh, in the classifier. Okay, when you look at them for this example, you get 92% uh, in a bit and 88%, uh, but these are two numbers. And as humans, we like one number. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to average them. Okay, so I'm running through this very quickly because I must get quickly to the linear classifier. It's also in the practical that you're going to do next. All right, so you're going to average them. The way to average them, because these are rates, are not the arithmetic mean, but happen to be the uh, harmonic mean, which is the inverse of the mean of the inverses. Okay, so, and this is what we call the F1 score. All right. So F1 score is an average, okay? It's not, a, it's not an arithmetic average, it's a harmonic average between the precision and the recall. We'll also see precision and recall in the, in the practicals, which we do next, okay? And for this specific classifier, one way in which we could have tuned the classifier is on the training set, once we have these two distributions, okay, because we have this from the training set, we can shift the threshold theta. We're shifting the threshold theta on this right-hand plot and looking at the F1 score. And then we pick the threshold that maximizes the F1 score. In this case, we get an F1 score, which is just around 0 0.9. We would then go, as we do in the code for this, to the test set and see if it really performs with mm -hmm. around 0 0.9, and yes, it does. Okay, so that's this, this naive classifier. Any quick questions on that? Okay, I'll steal about three minutes from our 10 minute break just to speak about linear classifiers because they're needed for the practical. And uh, we, we won't speak about this section 146, which is not critical. And we won't get to speak about 1.5 and you'll see that in the further lectures anyway. Okay, so, but I hope you read 1.5.
<coughs> uh, 1.46 doesn't have a whole lot uh, a, a great description, but what we do there is we basically take the linear classifier that I'm just going to show you and separate it into two linear classifiers. But we'll might review that in the further lectures. We can continue the course without it. All right. So now we saw this um, not great classifier, but let's get let's get to a good classifier. It's it's even actually a neural network, but it's a neural network with an identity activation function. So it's it's a degenerate neural network. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to do least squares. Okay, we're going to do least squares. We're going to use least squares for classification. Okay, now again, you should maybe if least squares, if you're not sure about least squares, ask us also in the consultation hours, but also look at the solution to the opening quiz. Uh, there's quite a bit of information for least squares, but let me explain how this works. So what we're going to do is we're simply going to do a one versus rest uh, classifier, just like we uh, specified up here. Okay, so we'll do a classifier for the digit zero, a classifier for digit one, a classifier for digit two, a classifier for digit three, up to a classifier for digit nine. Okay. And each time, what we're going to do is we're going to treat our 784 pixels as features, but we'll also add an additional feature, which is a bias. Okay. So we're basically going to create a data matrix, which is 60,000 by 785, okay? So 60,000 observations, okay? 60,000 uh, training samples and 785 fe features. The first one is going to be one, 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 one. This is, this is stuff I would have written with a pen, okay? So this is just like in statistics, a design matrix, all right? It's a design matrix where you've got your intercept of one. And for the response variable, well, when you're trying to classify the digit, say seven, you will say positive ones for every examples that are sevens and negative ones for other ones, okay? Similarly for digit eight, etc. So this is going to be your response wise. And then you're gonna solve a least squares problem. Now a solution in a least squares problem is achieved via the pseudo inverse if you'd like or, or a different way, okay? But you're going to minimize, you're going to find the beta superscript L. So you've got weight parameters for each digit L, which say, hey, what, how do I know what this digit is? Okay. So beta L is going to be the uh, minimizer of the least squares problem. Okay. And then you're going to do this formula here is exactly a one versus. Uh, rest classifier. So when you give me an input image X, okay, I think here X is the vectorized image, okay, the vectorized image, either column major or row major, it doesn't matter as long as we're consistent. I'm going to append to it this one for the intercept. Intercept in machine learning is also called the bias term, okay. And I'm going to multiply this by this beta L. Beta L is a 785 dimensional uh, vector. So how many parameters does this, uh, does this classify? And then I'm gonna do the maximal. I'm gonna see the L that maximizes this. And that's going to be my prediction for the digit. Okay, that's all. How many parameters does this classifier have? So how many parameters have we learned? Not hyperparameters or no hyperparameters really. How many parameters does this classifier have? <laughs> Well, 785 is for each L, is for each L, right? So for each digit, we, we know how to do the inner product. So how many does it have in total? This, this is a multi-class classifier, which gets an image and tells you if it's a digit zero, one, two, three, four, up to nine. Yeah, exactly. 700, 850 parameters, okay? And it, it's, you actually don't need to train it in an iterative manner because this uh, pseudo inverse and least squares problem for this dimension is solved very quickly and efficiently, okay? And the code for it here, so actually the actual pseudo inverse, by the way, needs to only be computed once, it's here, okay? So this is P inverse, that's computed, that's, sol that's in a sense the, the solution to the 
least squares minimization problem for any uh, potential right hand side. All right. And this is a classifier. This is actually the classifier. It just does the R of max. Okay. Beautifully, this classifier gives us an accuracy of 86%. Okay. It's, it's not enough to be kind of a robust thing. I mean, you know, we use digit recognition all the time when we go out of parking lots of shopping centers, uh, at least in Australia, your license plate is recognized, right? And read. Okay, we, we won't live with accuracy of 86%, but deep learning is gonna move us from this accuracy to 86% all the way to 99.7% pretty much. And what you see here is a confusion matrix. So it looks at this first row are all of the zero samples on the test set. This is actually tested on the test set. And there were 945 of the zeros were positively classified as zeros but there was a mistake. A few of those zeros were thought to be a twos and a, a few of them were thought to be a nines, et cetera. So you want a lot of weight on the diagonal and not much on the off diagonal. Then that's called the confusion matrix. So I should really stop here, maybe collect a question or two, and then we split off to the, we leave the Zoom lecture and you join Benoit or Sharat or myself in the alternative Zoom link for the other lecture, but but just is there? And sorry about the, all the trouble with the pen. Uh, any questions? Oh, so there's a question about the uploading of the recording. Yes, uh, it's it's already up, and you can find it here. Uh, oops. One sec, sorry. So the recording link is here. Okay. Now I got a question about that. Are there more questions? Yes, one. Yeah. Hi, Yoni. Thanks for the lecture. Uh, did you tell to the student for the slides for tomorrow or not really? Oh, very good. This is a very good question. Thank you, Ben Walike. So you will find here after in about an hour when we finish the practical, you'll find a link for Benoit's lectures. So you'll find links to slides that'll appear here. We'll put them online. Okay, so you can, Benoit will teach with slides tomorrow and the next couple of days, and you'll see the slides uh, prior to the lecture. You can look at them quickly prior to the lecture. But it's important that you actually for tomorrow's lecture that you spend time reading unit two for the next three hours of lecture. And I, I'm um, working on the typo. <laughs> But uh, uh, still, some uh, yes. Some, well, yeah. if you work on the typos, whatever you do, don't use a pen like mine because it doesn't work. Okay. okay. Yes. Good. Hi, Yoni. Yeah. Can you once again show the students uh, how to access these code files for uh, practical? Yeah, of course. Because okay. I got a couple of emails asking. No problem. So, so we we're now just before we finish and we go. So, if you're doing the practical with Benoit, then you've got the BL hyperlink here. That's good. That's just an HTML file, but in parallel, in a different tab, open the R source, okay? Uh, and then you can, or download the R source into R studio, et cetera. So that's for Benoit's practical. For Sharat's practical, you click the SM link here and that puts you in Google Collab. So that's actually, uh, you're, you're being hosted by Google. Uh, okay, it doesn't work for me now because I'm loaded here with a different uh, user that I need to log out, but that would work. Uh, okay, so if, if it doesn't work for you, then log out of your Google identity and that should work. Okay, that's for Google Collab. Um, I can even, let's just see it work. Uh, so if I, okay, yeah, if, I, if I'll sign out from this Google user, and then I go again to uh, um, to this, and you hit the SM. It'll now put me in Google Collab, and you can actually do all your computations on Google. Um, if you're doing it with me, then um, you just click this, and you can download. I mean, th this is a. You can go to the GitHub. Uh, repo and, and download this Jupyter Notebook. This is an NB viewer of the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so let's, uh, let's say bye-bye. Let's actually uh, 
start the practicals uh, with about a, a three minute delay. Uh, so leave the Zoom link and then join the individual Zoom links in Canvas um, for each of, for your respective lectures. In three okay. minutes, yeah. Okay, see you. Bye-bye. Bye, Yoni. Bye. -bye. Bye.